Why study cryptography and network security? I don't know, because where else can you get to use abstract algebra to defeat bad guys? But how about this? Cryptography is extremely important. You use it every day. In fact, it's so important, you're using it right now. Hi, I'm Alex Essex. I'm an Associate Professor of Software Engineering at Western University, Canada. This series of videos was recorded for a course I teach on undergraduate networking security and cryptography. This course was designed for fourth year software engineering students, but it's intended for anyone that's interested in this technology. And what a set of technologies this is. It's one of the most important things that you use in your daily life, and you don't even know it's there. Cybersecurity is the practice of protecting information systems, networks, devices, servers, hardware, from unauthorized access, disclosure, and modification. It's a really important part of the internet as it exists today. Cybersecurity is a very broad field, and in this course, we're only going to look at one side of it. One way to divide them up is across three lines. One line is information and network security. This is about protecting your data through the use of cryptography and secure network protocols. That's going to be the focus of this set of videos. Another interesting area of cybersecurity is software security. This is the study of finding vulnerabilities in software and then either exploiting them or fixing it so nobody can. When people write software, they're expecting it to do a certain thing. Imagine there was some way to take a piece of software that was written to do one thing and corrupt it to the dark side and make it do something else that wasn't intended. Another important area is system security. Now this focuses on preventing unauthorized access to sensitive resources in a cyber system. When you hear the term hacker being used, it's most commonly used in this context. Although hackers will often use software exploits in order to achieve greater privilege in systems. This series of videos, however, is focused on information security, cryptography, and secure network protocols. Now, when we talk about information security, we're interested in a few goals, a few security goals. The first property is called confidentiality. It's the ability to control who has access to data. The second property is called integrity, and it is the ability to detect when data has been modified by an unauthorized party. The third property is authenticity. That's the ability for an authorized entity to prove their identity. And finally, availability is about keeping your resources online. Now in this course, the three properties that we're interested in are confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. Availability is extremely important, but it's less of a focus in this course. Before we can talk about cybersecurity, we need to build a mental model. We need to have a common frame of reference to understand what it is that we're even trying to do and why. This course is about secure communication. Now, network communication happens all day, every day. It's even happening right now. So let's begin with a simple model. There are two network endpoints, A and B. The cybersecurity community jokingly calls these endpoints Alice and Bob. Now that communication can take place over any number of media, ranging from Wi-Fi to cellular to uh, wired uh, cable and fiber optics and uh, phone lines. We're not particularly interested in how the data is transmitted. We're more interested in the access that others can have to that data. As an example, let's consider your phone. Your phone broadcasts data all over the neighborhood using radio waves. Now your eyes can't see it, but trust me, it's there. If you have the right hardware, you can see this information being broadcast. So without encryption, all the things you do on the internet are being broadcast all around your neighborhood. And since it's a broadcast medium, anybody that's in range can listen. We call this eavesdropping. So one of the goals of secure network communication is to prevent eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is pretty bad, but it can actually be worse than that. 
if we have somebody that can insert themselves in between us in the communication channel, they can not only hear what we're saying, they can change it as well. This is what's known as the man in the middle. So one of the goals of information security is not only to protect the information from being observed, but also to be able to detect if it's ever modified. So here's an example. Suppose we use Wireshark, a free tool for capturing network packets as they're sent out from your computer. And we use it to visit example.com. That request is sent out over the internet in an unencrypted format because HTTP is not encrypted automatically. As you can see at the bottom, without encryption, this is the raw information that would be broadcast across your neighborhood or across the internet. So one of our goals is to apply encryption to our message so that even if there was an eavesdropper listening, they wouldn't know what we were saying because it would be essentially in a digital lock box, one that they don't have the key to unlock. Additional goals will include authenticity and message integrity. So if there was a man in the middle trying to alter the encryption, something inside would break and would give Bob an indication something went wrong. So one of the most important things to realize about network security protocols is don't try to make them yourself. Don't roll your own crypto. Don't try to do it yourself. And there's lots of good reasons why not. For one, cryptography is notoriously difficult to get right. Most of the cryptography we use today was highly vetted in some kind of international competition and then created into some sort of national standard. Designing your own cryptography puts you at an extreme disadvantage. It's you against the smartest people in the world. There are a lot of subtle and unimagined threats. Now, not designing your own crypto might seem like an intuitive thing, but believe me, I see this happening all the time. Another very important principle in cryptography is the assumption that the enemy knows how your system works. The idea is you need to assume the bad guys know the algorithm. They know the recipe. And despite all of that, it should still be secure. You can't rely on security through obscurity, even though many people try. But trust me, out there right now somewhere in the world is an engineer with nothing else better to do than to reverse engineer your system. They do it all the time. Another important thing to realize is that typically cryptography is not the weakest link in an information system. It's actually usually the strongest link. So typically cryptography isn't the thing that's bypassed, it's something else. And for most cryptography, as we'll see, it's possible to guess the key given enough time. We call this brute forcing. The idea is just to try every single possible key until you find the right one. Now as a mental model, imagine that a secret message was placed inside a box and locked shut using one of these padlocks. And for this example, let's just imagine that the steel that is used to build the padlock in the box is incredibly strong. There's no chance that we're going to be able to cut the lock. So if we want to get into the message, what are we going to do? Well, we can apply the brute force method. We can try every single combination in these locks until we find the one that unlocks it. So here's a question. How much work would we expect to have to do? Well, if we had a combination lock, with four dials on it, each dial ranged from zero to nine, there are 10,000 possible combinations that that lock could have. So we could begin at zero, 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 and try to unlock it. And if that doesn't work, we can try zero, 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 one. And if that doesn't work, zero, 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 two, and so on. Now you might get unlucky and have to try all 10,000 possible combinations. But on average, you would expect to try half that many. This leads us to an important term called bits of security. Let's start by taking all the possible combinations that you would have to try to unlock something. We take the logarithm base two of this number. Okay, so how many bits of security would be reasonable by today's standards? Well, let's take an example. Imagine we had a crypto system with four bits of security. If something has four bits of security, what we're saying is we're expecting to have to try two to the power of four or 16 different combinations in order to expect to find the right one. Okay, so here's a question. 
what's the smallest number of bits of security so you wouldn't have to worry about all the computers in the world, in fact, all the computers in the universe, ever being able to try that many combinations in the history of the entire universe? Well, let's think about that. Let's start at a nice round number, like 30. 2 to the 30 is about a billion. So is it reasonable to think that there's enough computing power in the world to try a billion different combinations of something? Yeah, I'd say probably. I mean, when you think about it, your computer runs at a clock speed of several billion instructions per second. Now, if you had a crypto system, you wouldn't be able to check one key per clock cycle. But modern cryptography is actually quite fast, so you actually probably could check a key in a few hundred clock cycles. So depending on what you're doing, doing 2 to the 30 of it might only take a few seconds. Okay, well what about a bigger number like 2 to the 60? That's like doing a billion of what we just talked about. Now that's a pretty big number, but is it a number that's bigger than what could be achieved by all the computing power in the world? Well, it turns out, actually no. If you've ever wondered what Bitcoin mining is, it's just calculating something called a hash function over and over and over. And when you take all of the Bitcoin mining pools in the world and put them together, they're collectively doing on the order of two to the 60 hashes per second. Okay, well, what if we doubled that exponent and we looked at 120 bits of security? So here's a question. Is that twice as hard as doing two to the 60 work? No, remember your high school math. 2 to the 120 is 2 to the 60 times 2 to the 60. So if the entire Bitcoin mining network of the planet Earth could do 2 to the 60 operations per second, it would take 2 to the 60 seconds to do 2 to the 120 hashes. That's a billion billion seconds, and that's a long time. Tens of billions of years. And as it turns out, this is a rough lower bound for the number of bits of security that we use in modern encryption today. But encryption is not the only thing we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about something called hash functions, message authentication codes, digital signatures, public key certificates, public key cryptography, transport layer security, and much, much more. So if you're into it, hit like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.